Just four years after the invasion, the Romans had established a network of roads and fortifications, one of which, the Foss Way, may even have acted as a temporary frontier. From the moment the invasion began, Roman businessmen, fortune seekers and even land grabbers were never far behind the invading troops. The Foss Way enabled the Romans to consolidate their gains before again pushing further north and to the west. The year is AD 60. Nero has been emperor for the past six years, following the death of his uncle, Claudius. And in the lands of the Iceni, the ashes of their dead king, Prasuticus, shall soon be gathered from the funeral pyre. His wife, two daughters, and his people are unaware that they are to be thrust into the realms and annals of history, myths, and legends. Following the death of Prasuticus, having left no male heir, Rome not only called in all loans, but also made a claim of full ownership against the lands of the Iceni and its people. Boudicca strongly contested all these claims and told the Romans to leave her lands. To press their point home, the Romans had Boudicca flogged and her two daughters, Iselda and Siora, defiled by soldiers of the legions. Believing the matter now closed, the governor of Britain, Gaius Sutinus Paulinus, led his legions on a campaign to the island of Mona, modern-day Anglesey, which had now become a refuge and stronghold for British rebels, as well as being the home of the Druids. Seizing this opportunity, the Iceni, Trinovantes and others joined Boudicca in a revolt against Roman occupation and oppression. They attacked Camulodunum, the former capital of the Trinovantes, it was now largely settled by retired legionaries who would all become well versed in the mistreatment of local Britons. Boudicca's army razed the city to the ground, sparing the lives of none. The 9th Legion, commanded by Quintus Petilius Serralis, rushed to relieve the city but was intercepted. His entire infantry cohorts were wiped out by Boudicca's forces. Only Serralis and a few of his cavalry escaped the onslaught. When Paulinus heard the news of the uprising, he took a small number of cavalry and made all haste to Londinium. Assessing the situation, he considered the new city would have to be sacrificed if the province was to be saved. He headed back up Watling Street as Boudicca's forces sacked Londinium. Paulinus put out a call for all available legions and auxiliary troops to muster north of Rulamium. He is eventually joined by his own legion, the 14th, returning from Mona, and various detachments of the 20th, as well as some auxiliary units. However, the prefect of the 2nd legion ignores the call completely. As Boudicca's forces now attack Rulamium, Paulinus, with an estimated strength of 10,000 troops, prepares the ground for an open field battle. Boudicca's forces lack the skills, training, discipline and overall cohesion for this type of warfare. And although Paulinus's troops are vastly outnumbered, they take the day. Following the Battle of Watling Street, neither Boudicca nor her daughters were captured or ever seen again. But Paulinus' savage retribution against the people of those tribes who had rebelled was so extreme and disproportionate that even Nero became concerned. And within a year of the battle, he replaces Paulinus with a more conciliatory governor. Following the suicide of Nero in June of 68 AD, Rome was thrown into a brief period of civil war in what has become known as the Year of the Four Emperors. The Brigantes were ruled by Queen Cartamandua, a loyal subject of Rome since the very first days of the invasion back in 43 AD. Her ex-husband, 
Venutius had long been a rebel against Roman occupation and had waged war on his ex-wife and her Roman protectors. Even before the Boudican uprising, Venutius had been building allegiances both within and outside of the Brigantes. And with this period of instability in Rome, Venutius staged his revolt against her. With the Romans no longer able to fully protect her, Cartamandua had to flee to Rome. And now the Brigantes had a warrior king instead of a Roman loving queen to lead them. It was Vespasian who emerged successfully as emperor from the Roman Civil War, and one of his close relatives was Quintus Petilius Serralis, the same man who had led the Ninth Legion to its destruction at the outset of the Boudican Rebellion. And in 71 AD, Vespasian appoints Serralis as the new governor to Britain. He was assisted by Gnaeus Julius Agricola, who commanded the 20th Legion. Agricola was also a veteran of the Boudican Rebellion, then serving as a junior officer under the command of Gaius Suetonus Paulinus. Between them, they set out on a major campaign against the Brigantes and claimed that they had beaten Benutius in a battle which took place somewhere near modern-day Stanwyck. However, there's no mention of Venutius having been killed or captured, and one may question the possibility of the Britons engaging in this type of field battle, which effectively put pay to the Boudican Rebellion. Such a lesson would certainly have been learned by the native Britons. Agricola left Britain in 73 AD, and Surrealis was replaced as governor in either 74 or 75 AD by Sextus Julius Frontinus. This would be Frontinus's final posting before his retirement from the military, and he concentrated all his efforts towards expanding the empire into what we now know today as Wales, securing any gold mines in the process. It had only been four years since Agricola had left the shores of Britain, but following Frontinus's retirement in 78 AD, Agricola now returned as the new governor of Britain, only to find that many of the British tribes had reverted back to self-rule. And it's at or about this time when the Ordoviques decide to wipe out an entire Roman cavalry ally, which is occupying their lands. Agricola had returned with an agenda as well as some unfinished business to settle. So, marching his legions up to the lands of the Ordoviques, he gives the order for his troops to put every man, woman, and child in the Ordovic villages and settlements to the sword. And for good measure, he lets his legions loose on the inhabitants of the island of Mona, which concludes the unfinished business from AD 60. The ancient Britons left no written records or accounts of the Roman invasion or their 400 years of occupation. All that we know today of this period has been obtained from the fragmentary remains of the writings of two Romans. Cassius Dio, who wrote 80 books on the 1,400 years of Rome, and Tacitus, who wrote, amongst other works, the life of Agricola. In the same year that Agricola was made governor of Britain, 78 AD, Tacitus married Julia Agricola, making Tacitus Agricola's son-in-law. Which begs the questions, just how accurate, critical, unbiased or fictitious were Tacitus' accounts of Agricola's time served in Britain as a junior officer, legion commander and as governor? Having re-established Roman rule and domination over the tribes of the south and to the west, Agricola now turned his attentions to the tribes of the north, and leading the 20th Legion, he engaged upon a brutal and savage seven-year campaign in an attempt to finally proclaim the whole of Britain as being a province of the Roman Empire. The mountainous regions of the Caledonian Highlands proved to be the first obstacle preventing Agricola from making such a proclamation. The second was Calgacus, king of the Caledoniae. Agricola was forced to consolidate his position 
by building a series of fortifications along the foothills of this mountainous region. Calgacus used hit and run tactics on any Roman soldiers that ventured into the mountainous glens of his lands. Agricola needed to find some way of drawing him out to fight the open battle which favoured the Roman style of warfare. His opportunity came when his forces located and seized the grain storage of the Caledoniae. Calgacus was forced to fight to recover the grain or see his people starve through the coming winter. And the place at which this epic battle would commence? Mons Gropius. Tacitus tells us Agricola's forces numbered 10,000 and he was outnumbered three to one by the Caledonians. After the battle, he suffered casualties of just 360 killed, whilst the Caledonians had lost some 10,000. And with this great victory, Agricola was now able to make the boastful proclamation that he had brought the whole of Britain under Roman rule and occupation. During his time as governor of Britain, Agricola had served under three emperors. With the death of Vespasian in 79 AD, he was succeeded by Titus, who died two years later, and was then succeeded by Domitian, who, behind the scenes, wasn't that impressed with being upstaged by Agricola, given that his own campaign in Germanica was providing only modest victories. Agricola was recalled to Rome in 85 AD, and the years that followed witnessed a gradual withdrawal from the northern territories as successive emperors required legions to fight battles in other parts of the ever-increasing empire. With the death of Trajan in 117 AD, Hadrian is named as his successor, but he spends the first six years as emperor, touring and consolidating the borders of the empire, and was due to arrive in Britain around 122 AD. But it was in AD 118 that Hadrian had appointed Quintus Pompeius Falco as the new governor to Britain. And it could well have been Falco's strong-handed attempts to re-establish Roman rule in the north that triggered a revolt by the Brigantes, Salgovie and many southern tribes of the Caledonians. So by the time Hadrian gave his commands to build the wall, just what had the Romans really accomplished? Rock was quarried at Walltown from 1877 to 1977, the removal of which, like Caulfield's quarry, destroyed a large section of Hadrian's Wall. Today, Walltown Quarry is part of the Northumberland National Park and has been turned into a nature reserve. It has full amenities, great for the family, as well as photographers and the artists. The Fort of Magnus was originally part of the Stangate fortifications and therefore built before Hadrian's Wall, which resulted in it being set back when the wall was built nearly 40 years later. Today, although close to the public, it lay southwest of the Roman Army Museum. Run by the Vindolanda Trust, the museum has some great exhibits as well as audio-visual presentations which I would have loved to have given you a brief glimpse of but it also has a very strict policy of no video or photography. As they say, where there's a will, there's a way. Welcome to VRAM. <laughs> 